Good morning, everyone. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Please join in the, the echo of our opening song. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour. Gathered here in one strong body. Gathered here in one strong body. Gathered here in the struggle and the power. Gathered here in the struggle and the power. Spirit draw near. Spirit draw near. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land where we gather today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Would like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and pledge our, again our ongoing commitment to reconciliation and justice for First Peoples and others in this land. God calls us on a journey of faith to follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. God has done amazing things. God is doing amazing things. God will do more amazing things. Let us worship the God who brings the dead to life and whose command brings into being what did not exist. Let's bow our heads. Let us pray. Faithful God, as we continue our journey of Lent, we come together as your family, your church, your people to worship and to learn from you. None of us are too young or too old to follow you. All of us can be surprised by new opportunities, new challenges, new ways to serve you. We are known by name and cherished as your children, whatever our age, whatever our circumstances, for you call and love us all, and we give you thanks. Amen. Let's stand and sing together to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done, so long he
Welcome everyone here today, those on Zoom, got a, a few extras, bit of, a few blowings, there's Jeff Gardner on Zoom, and, uh, and there's Janet and Lorna on Zoom, welcome to you guys, and uh, John and Lorna, and Jean as well, and then the ones who I can't see, oh Lauren's name's there, and Jen, so my mum AA is there, and David, and a phone, which I think is Joyce and Don's usually. So welcome to all of you on Zoom today and on video and to everybody here. It is the second Sunday of Lent. Uh, so we've got our, our second sort of symbol up there. It is also the, the day when Andrea and I joined Rachel to try and bid on a apartment for Rachel at an auction at 12.30. So we, we might sneak away fairly promptly after this and um, expecting to win this auction because all your prayers will be behind us. So uh, thank you very much for that. And does that mean it's a short sermon today, uh, Graham? Well, it shows how addicted I am now as a minister to preaching that I couldn't even today get a really short sermon. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sort of. So I confess that and let us uh, join in our prayer of adoration and confession, which has a few responses, which will be on the screen. Let us. Oh, and this is a um, beautiful prayer of adoration and confession written by my friend Jeff Schrouder, who does a, quite a few prayers that we use from today's psalm, Psalm 22, which is often drawn on during Lent and for Easter. So let us pray. Creating God, we praise you for your word, which called the universe into being, and for your spirit, which breathed life into your human creation made in your image. And we praise you that in your love, you seek to embrace us in our brokenness. And that while your only son was handed over to death, you raised him to life, a new creation by which you recreate each of us as we believe in hope and accept in faith. Source of life, word of life, breath of life, we worship you. Amen. Believe Christ's word of grace to us. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's stand and sing together as the deer pants for the water.
Welcome, Jess, Felix, and Scarlett. Would, would you feel feel like you could come up and have a chat to me now that you've just arrived, just in time? Come up to the front, be the centre of attention with me. Be very good. How was your week? Would you say has it been a good week for you? Any, anything special to tell us about your week? Your hand is healed, which means? I can finally do stuff with my hand, like make a fist or open it full. There you go. Has a stitch has been taken out? Yes. Yeah, because you had two stitches. Yeah, oh, that was a good thing. What about you, Scarlett? What? Oh, I was going to tease you and get the name wrong again, but I forgot. <laughs> what What about your week? My, my week, I... <laughs> I've, I've, um, I've been, um, I've been doing some painting. Painting, beautiful. And you like doing your painting? Yeah. With paintbrush or with fingers or with paintbrush? Paintbrush, yeah, beautiful, very good. Well, my week was a very busy one, and on Friday, my wife Andrea and I went for a long drive up to Bendigo for a funeral service for Andrea's auntie, who died at 97 years old. And um, there was lots of good things that we got to enjoy, and people and conversations to catch up. And I, there was something really odd for me, because we always called her Auntie Jean. But when we got up there, on the order of service, it said Barbara was her name. Barbara, in inverted commas, Jean, um, Fox. So what? And, uh, and Andrea didn't know the story and nobody commented on it during the day. So it's just that it used to happen a little bit more that people weren't that keen on their names. They got called by another name, like my mum, who's on... Zoom at the moment, we can't see her, but she can see us. Her name was Myra, but Myra Hilton, but she didn't like the name Myra, so she got called by her second name, which was Jill, which was funny because her mum, her mum's name was Annie, um, but she got called by her second name, which was... Peter wasn't oh, paying uh, Gladys, uh, sorry, Gladys. <laughs> Very good, just checking you were paying attention. But, um, <laughs> Gladys, yeah. And my grandfather, whose name was John Norman Bartley, and he used to be headmaster of your school. He was principal at Hughesdale Primary School in the 1940s and 50s. But before that, he was um, fought in World Wars. And when he was a soldier, he didn't want to be called by John. He was known as Jack. And um, he also didn't get called John. He got called Norm a lot as well. I, I don't know why. Um, but in all of the school things that I've read, historical things, he's known as John N. Bartley. But some people, do, do you know anybody who's got, who gets called by a name other than their name? Or, you know? What do you, 
Oh, well, I call you Charlotte. Or other people call you Charlotte. Is that the main thing? Or? Sometimes I get mixed up because there's, there's a person in grade two named Charlotte and I'm friends with her. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Charlotte and Scarlett, that's great. Do you know anybody who's changed their names or got different names or nicknames, Felix? No, not. Felicities? Yeah. Oh, Mum calls okay. me Felicity. If, if Mum wants to stir you up a bit, she could. My dad also calls me Mr. Felix. Mr. Felix. Well, when I was a, there was a cartoon that I really liked as a boy. Anybody call me by that one? You know what yeah. it is? Me and Felix the cat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Felix the cat. Okay. You like that one? I'm yeah. Named after Grove. Oh, Felix Grove. Felix Grove. And what can you tell us about Felix Grove? My mum used to live there in a nice house. Oh. Well, Felix is a wonderful word. Do you know what the word means? It means lucky in Latin. It does. Felicitatious. Felicity is about luck and good luck. It's also a bit related to the word for faithfulness, I think. Do you know what scarlet means? Scarlet means a really bright red that, that, that is really pretty and, and it can be used for lots of stuff like roses. Doesn't that make a great name? Mm -hmm. Really bright, really pretty and useful for lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's some famous people who are celebrities and singers and actors who changed their name because they thought their name was a little bit ordinary or whatever, and they changed it. I'm going to test people out here to see if they know. You can throw it in as well. Got four for you. They're, they're the better known ones, so I expect some good responses. Robert Zimmerman. Bob Dylan with Peter and David pretty quick. So we can see on the slide up there or up there. Someone called Robert Zimmerman was a very famous, was a very famous singer in the 60s and still is performing. So Robert Zimmerman became Bob Dylan. Anyone know this one? Cassius Clay? <laughs> I think we know. Yeah, do you know? I know one thing called Scarlet and the Wind. Oh, yeah. Gone with the Wind. Scarlet O'Hara. Gone with it. Yeah. Well, let's look at the slides. Uh, whoa, have we jumped all the way to there? There we go. That's a, that's a famous one. So on the, the left-hand side, you see the boxer in the middle won the, Olympic, the gold medal at the Olympics 1960, I think, called Cassius Clay, but then he became world champion and was Muhammad Ali, changed his name to that, which was a religious name, connection. Uh, what about this one? Norma Jean Baker famous actress. And last one, Reginald Kenneth, yeah, <laughs> Reginald Kenneth Dwight. Have you ever heard of any Elton John songs? Crocodile Rock? Tiny, I'm a tiny dancer. Tiny dancer. He's the one who, uh, who wrote and put a candle in the wind. Yeah, that's him. Well, today, the reason why we're talking about name changes is our... Um, is our Bible story has a name change for um, well, these two characters that I've got here. I've got a slightly bigger one up there. His name was Abram and her name was Sarai. And because they heard from God, somehow God spoke to them about what God wanted them to do God actually wanted them to have children. See any problems with these two having children? What if the two the, the kid becomes evil? Mm, what if the kids become evil? Well, that's always a a bit of a worry, or a slight worry. <laughs> um, they're very old though. They're He's 99, and she's very old. And um, 
God says, no, actually, I want you to have children. You'll know that I'm involved in this. You know it's something that is a God thing going on. But I need you to trust that I want you to have children. And then I want them to have lots of children, as many as, what can you see in the background? Lots of stars in the sky. Yeah, and we, we could count. You could probably count all of those. And then you, but then we know there's a whole lot more stars in the sky. And God said, I want you to have all those people. And I'm, so that all those people will know about me, about God, and trust in God being their God and try and live good lives the way God wants them to. So his name, Abram, gets changed to the word Abraham. You ever heard Abraham? Abraham in Hebrew, yes. So that's what it is. And that sounds like the Hebrew word for ancestor or father of many nations. And then Sarai's name gets changed to Sarah. And in Hebrew, any idea what Sarah means in Hebrew? Your great grandmother's name? Doris. Doris. It means princess. So we've got father of many nations and the princess and all those stars reminding us that God's saying to them, I want to fix the world not by flooding it and doing another Noah story and putting up another rainbow. I want to fix it by your descendants being a blessing to the world. And we think about that today as us being like some of those stars in the sky. So we're going to sing the song in a moment that we uh, started last week. And the first verse is about the rainbow. And, um, and then the next verse is about today. And um, you and Sue might do something amazing with Abram and Sarai. I don't know if you will or not, but you, you can uh, work out what you want to do. So lovely to see you here again today. Charlie's not here. So Felix wondering if um, when it comes to the prayer time, you might take the microphone around from Charlie's place today. You'll do that? Okay, that'd be good. Okay, thanks. Let's sing. Let's sing. <laughs> sign of my love for you, as a sign of my promise to all the earth, visible where gray sky me I will place my child in your womb, as a sign of my love for you, when you love and the wonder So the Old Testament reading today is that one of um, God speaking to Abram 
and making him Abraham and Sarah into Sarah. It's actually the, the third time that they get this covenant promise given to them of having lots of descendants. Slightly different emphasis uh, each time. But that's the uh, one today is from chapter 17. And then we get a fair chunk of Paul reflecting on the significance of that and the fact that Abram and Sarai just go on their faith that this is God there and that they trust in God. And then um, the gospel reading uh, takes us back to our pivot point in Mark's gospel as uh, they're preparing to head to Jerusalem. Thank you, David. Today is from, uh, uh, from Genesis, um, um, book 17, chapters 1 to 7 and 15 to 16. Uh, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the almighty God. Obey me and always do what is right. I will make my covenant with you and give you many descendants. Abraham bowed down with his face touching the ground and God said I make this covenant with you I promise that you will be the ancestor of many nations your name will no longer be Abram but Abraham because I am making you the ancestor of many nations I will give you many descendants and some of them will be kings you will have so many descendants that they will become nations I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in future generations as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. God said to Abraham, you must no longer call your wife Sarai. Now on her name, it is Sarah. I will bless her and I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will become the mother of nations and there will be kings among her descendants. Our next reading is from Romans, uh, chapter 4, uh, verses 13 to 25 in the Good News Translation. When God promised Abraham and his descendants that the world would belong to him, he did so not because Abraham obeyed the law, but because he believed and was accepted as righteous by God. For if what God promises is to be given to those who obey the law, then faith means nothing and God's promise is worthless. The law brings down God's anger, but where there is no law, there is no disobeying of the law. And so the promise was based on faith in order that the promise should be guaranteed as God's free gift to all of Abraham's descendants, not just to those who obey the law, but also to those who believe as Abraham did. For Abraham is the spiritual father of us all. As the scripture says, I have made you father of many nations. So the promise is good in the sight of God in whom Abraham believed, the God who brings the dead to life and whose command brings into being what did not exist. Abraham believed and hoped even when there was no reason for hoping and so became the father of many nations. Just as the scripture says, your descendants will be as many as the stars. He was then almost 100 years old, but his faith did not weaken when he thought of his body, which was already practically dead. It looks much healthier in the picture before, but no. <laughs> or of the fact that Sarah could not have children. His faith did not leave him and he did not doubt God's promise. His faith filled him with power and he gave praise to God. He was absolutely sure that God would be able to do what he had promised. That is why Abraham, through faith, was accepted as righteous by God. The words he has accepted as righteous were not written for him alone. They were written also for us who are to be accepted as righteous, who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from death, 
because, because of our sins, he was given over to die and he was raised to life in order to put us right with God. Our final reading is from the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples, the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders. The chief priests and the teachers of the law, he will be put to death, but three days later he will rise to life. He made this very clear to them. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples and rebuked Peter. Go away from me, Satan, he said. Your thoughts don't come from God, but from human nature. Then Jesus called the crowd and his disciples to him. And if any of you want to come with me, he told them, you must forget yourself, carry your cross and follow me. For if you want to save your own life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for me and for the gospel, you will save it. Do you gain anything if you win the whole world but lose your life? Of course not. There is nothing you can give to regain your life. If you're ashamed of me and of my teaching in this godless and wicked day, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of our Lord. Praise be to God. Let us pray. Our loving God, through our reflections, help us to listen, to pay attention to your word to each of us. Amen. Okay, who knows this reference? Oh, enough about me. What do you think about me? Anybody know that one? Bet Midler in the movie Beaches. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I initially wrote. And then when I was Googling online to check, they cut it down to that. Say it again a bit louder, Peter. But enough about me. What about you? What do you think of me? Yes. Even better version. I was right in my memory. Okay, I should have gone back to the movie, shouldn't I? Um, how, how would you summarise the the growth in the movie? What's the, the plot? What's the thing, Peter? Can you grab a marker? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Corinne. <laughs> Can you, can you use the microphone next to you, Fred? <laughs> um, so it's two friends, um, uh, one of whom is a bit of a kind of needy uh, entertainment type person. Um, and uh, uh, I guess the, the story arc is from when they're children and as, as they grow up and get older. Um, and I guess their friendship splits up at various points, but they come back together. Um, and uh, should, do I avoid spoilers or? Uh, no, you can give them. I mean, it's a bit of a tearjerker. One of the friends uh, turns out has a, a sort of genetic condition that means she uh, uh, dies fairly young. Um, but this uh, this friend has a child, and so the Bette Midler character, you know, kind of looks after and becomes kind of a friend of the child as well. Is that? Yeah, that's good. And. Uh... Would somebody else like to say what's the what's the growth in in that arc story for C. C. Bloom, the Bette Midler character? Lisa. Well, I think it comes up about the subject too. Got a little bit. Got a little bit. They're very good friends and very different people. And um, so the Bette Midler character is the needy one. And the other woman, when she knows she's going to pass away, asks her friend, will you look after my child and raise her? But and in, the, in the lead up, the, the needy one, she talks a lot and becomes a famous singer, but keeps on drawing on this friend when she needs her. And this friend um, gives of herself and sacrifices for Bette Midler. 
And the song that I referred to is, did you ever know you're my hero? So basically she sings about her love and friendship for somebody who was every, in the words, says, you're everything I wish I could be. So to me, that's, you know, she just admires the, that they're different and there's actually a depth of love. So even though she's been quite a, um, say narcissist. Yeah, <laughs> no, narcissistic, yes, yes. And I think it also breaches, uh, breaches on the on the subject of selflessness and empathy and being a good friend uh, and being loyal to your friends um, in their time of need. Indeed. And so it tends to be a bit one way during the movie, like the, the C.C. Bloom character tends to take a lot and the other one gives a lot, but then the one who's given a lot dies and C.C. Bloom has to take up the cross, make the sacrifice of looking after her friend's child. And in it, she loses a lot of that chance to, to perform and practice and do that, but she, she gains from this um, giving of herself to another that she so admired in her friend that she sang, you are the wind beneath my wings. So those themes of selflessness is what um, connects with our uh, reading from the gospel today. Forget yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So Jesus' call to deny yourself or forget, forget yourself in order to be his follower can sound overwhelming or even impossible sometimes to our ears, even if you do remember that Jesus also called us to love our neighbours as we love ourselves does help to remember that. Actually, it's important to remember that so we don't get to be like that friend who was actually exploited or, um, or we don't get to the point where we um, neglect ourselves. Um, love your neighbour as you love yourself. Forget yourself or deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. We're all in there together. So what does, what does Jesus mean, forget yourself, take up your cross and follow me? Well, as I was, as I was reflecting on this question and, and, and what various commentators have to say about it, I thought again about people who give their lives for an important cause and um, you probably like me that Alexei Navalny in Russia, that news was um, awful, though not surprising. Um, he was relatively safe and healthy once he got over the poisoning when he was and when he was outside of Russia, but he gave up the safety in exile to lead the political opposition from inside Russia, knowing that he would be imprisoned as soon as he got off the plane in Moscow and that he would be vulnerable to being killed. And similarly, I thought about the, the pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong and, and elsewhere who, uh, who risk their lives for the sake of the, the broader um, life of the, the country. And then coming down a bit more, I, I also thought about the brave souls who advocate for people in need who don't have a voice like asylum seekers and risk nasty treatment for supporting the unpopular cause of caring about displaced people. And then having a chat with, um, with Lynn Cowan got me thinking about the, the various ways that I see people on our level here in Coatesville Uniting Church forget themselves and follow Jesus' example. And mostly you're not risking your lives, fortunately, but that you are being helpful for others with no hint of expecting anything in return. And as I was reflecting on that, it seemed to me that all those people that I was picturing in here are really good at listening. And it got me thinking that the, the first step in forgetting yourself and following Jesus is to really listen. And you know there's a difference between listening to someone 
so you can hear what they're saying, you're really paying attention to their words and maybe paying attention to what they're not quite getting to express. There's a difference between that and listening to someone while you're thinking about what you're going to say and the great story or need that you're going to tell. You're actually listening, waiting for the person to take a breath so that you can butt in. Um, we know that difference. So the insight I want to offer to you today, or what feels like an insight to me, is that forgetting yourself or denying yourself in order to be a follower of Jesus, the key part of the starting with that or resuming of that is with genuine, attentive listening to another person and or to God. So I wonder how you would rate yourself as a listener. This is just a um, rhetorical question, okay? <laughs> Keep it to yourself. How would you rate yourself as a listener? And then I wonder if thinking about it, it would be a good Lenten discipline for, uh, for you. Rather than just giving up the chocolate or the alcohol or the social media for Lent, maybe work on giving up a bit more time towards developing further your listening, your attentiveness to others and to God. So we had an ex example of extraordinary listening to God in our Old Testament reading. Remember that Abram and Sarai did not have any background in synagogue or church. They didn't have any scriptures to learn from. They didn't even have YouTube videos to learn from. They just paid attention. So when Abram was 99 years old and the Lord appeared to him, Abraham listened. That's great. We don't get any details of dreams or visions or light or dark or cloud or how God appeared or sounded. All we get is God spoke and Abraham bowed down with his face touching the ground, which is very appropriate for demonstrating your reverence, but also for helping you to listen. And then somehow elderly Abram, Abraham takes on this impossible message from this spiritual entity that he's encountered and then proceeds to live as if the impossible is possible. To live by faith. And then our epistle reading points out how this acting in faith filled him with power and put him in a right relationship with God. It was the faith that mattered rather than how well he executed whatever program or things God wanted him to try. Abraham and Sarah listened, paid attention and let God be God for them. And the gospel reading today gave us the opposite, gives us an extraordinary example of not listening to Jesus. We're back at that pivot point of the gospel where we were two weeks ago. Jesus has been doing amazing authoritative acts of healing and casting out evil in various forms. And he's about to head south for Jerusalem, the center of Jewish religious power and the place of Roman oppression. And Peter has just answered Jesus' identity question correctly. Who do people say I am? You're the Messiah. But then Peter refuses to hear Jesus teaching to the disciples, saying, the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He'll be put to death, but three days later he will rise to life. So Peter is presumably thinking his own thoughts at this stage. Jesus is the Messiah. Thinking perhaps of how Jesus could cleanse the corruption and the hypocrisy within the temple, and religious leadership, most likely he's imagining a potential overthrow of the Roman overlords. So he's not listening to what Jesus is teaching about the path, the way to liberation and salvation. So Jesus tells him, get away from me, Satan. 
Ouch. This is actually a poor translation, I reckon. Get behind me is in other translations and more accurate and also more helpful and it reflects that Peter is getting in front of Jesus and telling him what's what, acting like Satan the tempter. When what Peter needs to do is get behind Jesus and follow because there's still much for him to learn. So Peter's strength is his direct honest speaking along with his courage and his energy and his actions, but his weakness is the flip side. His need for better listening, paying attention to discern what God in Jesus wants from him. If you want to come with me, Peter, forget yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And of course, therein lies the challenge for all of us with our own mixtures of strengths and weaknesses. A friend of mine used to remind me sometimes, there are many people these days who would like to serve God in an advisory capacity. Peter's weakness is one that most of us can relate to. Which is why I suggest to you, maybe some of us could make our Lenten discipline this year a commitment to practice listening with more attentiveness to God and our neighbours. It's not too late to start, still five weeks to go. Take up your cross by sacrificing extra time each day to pray, to read the Bible, to sit in silence before God and sacrifice the time and energy to listen to your family and your neighbours for what they are trying to communicate to you, which may be a bit more than the words that they are able to express. Some years ago, this church did something like that as a group. Notice the needs around food security for some of our neighbours set up a community care program which has made a significant difference in the lives of many families and individuals around here. And then if you read your shuttle in the month before last, you would have seen um, Gail telling the story of how not too long ago, she noticed people at the supermarket where she works, having to put food back in the shelves out of their trolley because couldn't afford to have all that food in their trolley, the financial constraints. So there was noticing, paying attention, listening, and then acting has led to our community food pantry, providing support additional to community care to more people who need it. It's a significant way that together we do our corporate forgetting of self. During the week, Dave sent me an email, somebody asking him for help who was, was homeless. And he said, what can we do? And at least I had one response was, well, our community care and our food pantry might be able to help. So it's a significant way that we do our corporate forgetting of self, the emergency relief that's been imagined, supplied, supported in all sorts of ways by people in this congregation. It's a part of our call as this community of faith to forget ourselves and take up our cross. All those who are actively involved in the programs and everyone who supports in different ways. It's part of our forgetting self, taking up your cross and following Jesus. And of course we have other actions and activities as a church where we use our gifts for God's loving purposes and where we seek to live by faith in God's promises. And of course, on the individual level too. And so our challenge for Lent and always is to keep listening for how God wants us to be faithful partners in the covenant that he began 
with Abram to bless the world. So hear the good news. You are blessed. So you may be a blessing for the world. Lose your life by giving it in God's service and you receive life. You are saved. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we worship God with our offering, let's sing the song based on the prayer of St. Francis, which um, picks up some of these thoughts. Make me a channel of your peace. Make me a channel of your God, in the unity of Christ, we bring our diverse gifts. Let your Holy Spirit breathe life into our serving so that all we do brings glory to your name. Amen. Uh, Janet's away sick today. She's got a cold and doesn't have much of a voice this morning. So the big thing. Found that the Wongoling Beach Shopping Centre in Mission Beach is the big bird that gave the Casuary Coast its name. While the statue is five metres tall, the actual bird itself, known for their wondrous red and blue wattles, can reach up to 1.7 metres and weigh up to 76 kilograms. The rainforest cloaked hills around Mission Beach provide the perfect habitat for the big birds. And there are several street signs that warn motorists to slow down in case of casualties crossing. Okay, next are our birthdays. And Yes, today's birthday is Norma Nash's birthday. Happy birthday. Yep. Um, tomorrow, Gail Tipton, and on Tuesday, Jodie Williams. And then John and Lorna Barcham's anniversary is today. Happy anniversary. The notices for today. Oh, yes, that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. 
of day normal. Okay, so the notices for today. Today, the coffee cup challenge has raised $134.50. We hope you enjoyed your pancakes last week. And thanks to all involved in that day, so far that event has raised $285 for Uniting. If you still got money for the coffee cup challenge, it's not too late to hand it in. You can put it in the plate or hand it to Mandy. Just be sure to label it as coffee cup challenge. The World Day of Prayer is this Friday, Friday the 1st of March at 1pm at St Agnes's Anglican Church in Glen Huntley. Rumour has it that someone we know quite well will be preaching. <laughs> Uh, see Jill, Jill Brocott for those details. So next is joys and concerns. So if we start with the... Uh, the prayers of the peoples from Roots. Incredible God, we thank you and praise you for trusting in us. Even when we find it hard to trust in you, we thank you and praise you for offering us more than we could ever imagine. We thank you and praise you for making the impossible possible. We thank you and praise you for all the blessings of youth and of age. We pray for followers of Jesus Christ, for those who are imprisoned for their faith, for those who serve as missionaries, for teachers of the faith. We pray for those who deny themselves to serve others, for those who work in hospitals and prisons, for those who are carers, for those who serve their communities as volunteers. We pray for those who carry the weight of a cross, for the homeless and unemployed, for those who are ill or bereaved, for those who struggle with mental health. We pray for ourselves as we follow Christ for strength to overcome our struggles and failures for our fears and worries, for those we love and those who love us. Amen. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Let's stand and sing together the summons. <laughs> Come and follow me if I call your name. Will you go where you don't go and never be the
know now and live before God in openness and integrity. Set your minds on the ways of God, not clinging to your own life, but taking up your cross and following Jesus. And may God give you a share in the eternal covenant. May Christ Jesus be proud of you when he comes in glory. And may the Holy Spirit make you grow strong in faith and lead you in the ways of righteousness. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. John and Lorna, congratulations on your anniversary. How many?